Malaysia is cancelling a project to build a high-speed rail line between Kuala Lumpur and Singapore. How will this affect bilateral relations between the two? And after a TV personality in the UK suggested museums should return foreign treasures looted in past centuries to their countries of origin, a debate is ranging over this moral dilemma and whether it is indeed practical to do so. Welcome to The Point. I'm Jeff Moody, sitting in for Liu Xin. Malaysia's cabinet has agreed to scrap the high-speed rail, or HSR, project between the capital Kuala Lumpur and Singapore, the newly elected Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad said on Wednesday. The agreement was signed in 2016 and was overseen by the then Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak and his Singapore counterpart Lee Sen Loon. Mahathir said his government was also in the process of renegotiating with Chinese partners over the terms of a $17 billion rail deal known as the East Coast Rail Link, claiming it's not going to serve any purpose, it's not going to give us any returns. Mahathir has become the world's oldest leader. The 92-year-old politician who previously served as Malaysia's Prime Minister for 22 years between 1981 and 2003 won a shock victory in the country's election this month, upending six decades of control by the ruling coalition. So, what are his priorities and how will his move affect the relationship between Malaysia and Singapore? And what is Mahathir's policy towards China? Well, I'm joined in Boston by Dr. Sophie Lemier, a fellow at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University, and in the studio here in Beijing by Su Chin Duo, a senior fellow at the Pangol Institution. Thank you both very much indeed for joining me. Um, I want to start with you, Sophie, if I may. Um, it reduces the travel time from Kuala Lumpur to, to Singapore to 90 minutes. It was cur it's currently five hours or more by road. It has been described as a strategic development in bilateral relations that will dramatically improve connectivity between the two countries. So why doesn't Mahathir want it? Well, I think that, you know, Mahathir is trying to reaffirm uh, the, you know, Malaysian uh, position uh, on the international scene. So he's basically, you know, in an operation of renegotiating uh, all the contracts and agreements that were made previously by uh, his predecessor, Najib. Uh, so I think that this project um, is... Uh, rather than cancelling or calling off the project totally, Mahathir is attempting to renegotiate the term of the project that are seen to not be favouring uh, Malaysian economy at all. But it's not going to be that easy though, is it? Because at the end of the day, um, Singapore has yet to receive official notification from them that this is going to happen. And we also know that they can't just walk away from it. Things have been written, contracts have been signed. Yeah, of course, rather than walking away, I think that Mahathir is really trying to uh, find some leverage to renegotiate the term uh, in order to uh, favor Malaysian economy much more. We've seen that, you know, the, the cost of the project are tremendous uh, and would be a burden on Malaysian economy. Right now, uh, Mahathir's agenda is really to reduce any expenditure of the government uh, that, you know, has been uh, put at uh, a great risk by the previous Prime Minister uh, due to the mismanagement of the fund. Um, so rather than cancelling the project totally, I think that Mahathir is trying to renegotiate the term, renegotiate the cost, uh, and maybe just pushing it back uh, rather than cancelling it completely. As you said, it would be very difficult and costly as well to completely uh, cancelling it. Uh, so I think that it's just, you know, trying to uh, buy some time. Sujin Duar, do you think this is just a way for Mahathir to get back at Singapore? I mean, after all, he's not a great friend of the Singaporeans, is he? When he was last in power, his relationship with Singapore hit rock bottom, and he said at the time it was impossible for the two to be friends. Well, uh, it's, it's not unreasonable, let's say. Uh, the two countries, uh, Malaysia and Singapore, they um, haven't enjoyed a very strong relationship or friend on friendly term, let's say, uh, because the relationship is not free of problems. For example, this uh, dispute over a small island, it was ruled uh, at the end of the day uh, to belong to Singapore, but you know, many Malaysian people are not happy with that. And also about uh, the purchase, you know, Singapore purchasing water from Malaysia uh, 
after processing the water and resell it back to Malaysians at a higher price. People are not happy with that, things like that. And of course, this uh, HSR the project is the latest uh, uh, program between the two countries. Uh, well, you know, the criticism against such a project is not wholly un unreasonable, let's say, uh, because usually if you want to make profits out of such a high-speed rail, uh, it's better to be to connect like to cities with a huge population. For example, like Beijing and Shanghai, there's high-speed rail. The two cities are with a population of more than 20, about 24 million people. So with a l large population, and then it's easier for you to make a profit. I think that is uh, the challenge. And also sometimes infrastructure projects, it does, uh, you know, uh, like uh, being established uh, earlier than the real need coming to probably. But, you know, this is a new government. They are trying, I agree with my colleague, they are trying to renegotiate to get some favorable, favorable probably conditions here. But he's concerned, isn't he, with actually lowering the national debt. That's the problem here. It's not necessarily a political move because he's coming to power and he's wanting to do everything different from his predecessor. It's more a case of lowering the national debt, which that at the moment is a third of the GDP of the country. That's right. That's right. But then there are, yes, at the same time in Malaysia, there are differing voices. People, there are people who are opposed to such an idea to cancel such a project completely. Because if you cancel the project, according to the agreement, according to the contract, Malaysia probably has to pay uh, billions of dollars. Then itself is a, a new debt on the Malaysian government. Uh, so I think uh, here uh, it's just this idea. I, I finally, the two countries, uh, they will need some renegotiation and how to proceed with this project. Of course, it's not just this project, is it? Sophie, this one for you. The government's also in the process of renegotiating the East Coast Rail Link, which is, of course, a Chinese project, which is associated with the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Mohammed said it is not going to give us any returns. Is it possible that he might also cancel this project? Well, I think we need to look at, you know, how Mahathir is defining its foreign policy as a whole uh, through the decision that he's taking over those projects. So the, the foreign policy of a country means, like, really to send a message outside, but as well inside with its own population. So Mahathir is really, like, through those de decisions and through uh, those announced, as trying to um, um, express, you know, the new interest of, of Malaysia and that the, the Malaysian interest will be at the front scene, you know, of, of the foreign policy. So it's what he's expressing now, saying that we don't want projects that are too costly for the Malaysian society, that are too costly for the Malaysian government. Uh, yes, we do want to work, you know, in partnership with, you know, in the region and internationally. Uh, we should remember that even if Mahathir always had, like, very controversial position internationally, he always maintained a certain level of cooperation. So even when he was, like, extremely... Um, uh, controversial in his declaration, uh, anti-American sentiment and declaration. He always maintained a close uh, cooperation military uh, for security and for the military. Uh, so I think what we're seeing today with Singapore and China is more like a kind of a stand, it's a positioning um, for his own, you know, uh, for his own domestic interest and for the international interest. So it's, it's sending a message uh, rather than really taking uh, any, any aggressive position towards any country. Of course, the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Hua Chunying has been replying. They've said, she said that China and Malaysia have maintained close economic trade and investment cooperation, which has delivered tangible benefits to our two peoples. China stands ready to continue with our close cooperation with Malaysia. So what actions do you think that Chinese investors can do now in the current situation? They don't know whether they've got work or not. Well, I think that, you know, uh, Mahathir is not going to try to jeopardize uh, the China-Malaysia uh, uh, trade relation in any way or, or the, foreign, you know, the foreign investment in Malaysia. I think he just want, of course, to mark a change between Najib's policy and his policy. We've seen that Najib's policies toward foreign investment and towards foreign trade in general and foreign policy were matching most probably his own agenda, his own personal agenda and his own domestic policies agenda. Uh, Najib was in need for cash 
for quick cash uh, through project and it's what he got you know by offering uh, some contract to China and to Chinese investors um, I believe that Mahathir doesn't want to seize all those kind of agreement because it would not go you know with the interest of the country but I think he wants to step in and to reposition the country uh, on the international scene as a country that is you know uh, pushing uh, the, the national interest uh, first it's easy, of course, to say so that. So I think, in any way, this should not be. Carry on. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You carry on. It's okay. Uh, I think this should not come, you know, as. Um, as a worry uh, for investors in general, whether they are Chinese investors or, or other you know, uh, foreign nationalities investors. Uh, Mahathir always being proven to be uh, a very good economist. Uh, he has been able to take a strong stand in the, 19, uh, in the 90s, late 90s, uh, towards the uh, MFA as well. Uh, so he, he has at heart you know, the interest of the country and the economic interest. And, it's, and we see that as well in the decision that he took to appoint you know, this council of elders that is composed of uh, brilliant economists such as uh, Joe Mokies um, and, and Deng Zainuddin was the former uh, finance minister. Um, rest is to see uh, who will be uh, the, foreign, uh, the foreign affairs ministers, uh, who will be appointed. And that can send a very, very strong message as well to China uh, and to the rest of the world. You're talking there about being in the national interest. Of course, there's another side to this, and I want Xu uh, Xinjiao to answer this if possible. Of course, there's the political issue. He's never liked Singapore. He's been very vocal over the years in, in saying that Singaporeans, uh, we, you can never be friends with a Singaporean, he very famously said. He's also described his predecessor, Najib, as a monster who was practically destroying the country and selling Malaysia out to China. This does feel, although we can justify it perfectly well by saying that it's, it's lowering the national debt, there's a lot of good reasons why this shouldn't go ahead, it does feel like it's a political decision, though, doesn't it? I think so. You know, remember, those uh, languages uh, are basically uh, you know, election rhetoric. And uh, you know, he used to be known, and he's still a uh, nationalist, a Malaysian nationalist. Uh, he's serving the interests of the nation, of the Malaysians. Uh, and it's easy to win election by uttering those kind of languages. But in terms of uh, Malaysia-China relationship, uh, I don't think there's a big problem. Even you have a problem with this particular project, it's just case by case, just an isolated case. Uh, I think the priority, uh, it has a lot to do with his priority of the new government, that is uh, uh, the debt, uh, the cutting of the debt, and also the uh, getting rid of uh, uh, corruption uh, associated with the previous uh, government. Uh, I think that's two challenges with the new government. Uh, ultimately, it's really about governance of the country, in particular the economic growth, a sustainable economic growth of this country. I don't think uh, his government can afford uh, not to do overseas investment because that helps uh, uh, to boost the country's economic growth. Okay, Dr. Sophie Lemieux from Harvard University and Xu Qingduo, a fellow, senior fellow at the Pangol Institution. Thank you both very much indeed for that. We'll be taking a short break now. After this break, we'll be looking at the moral dilemma faced by museums who are facing increasing calls to return treasures looted from other countries in years gone by. Stay with us for that. Welcome back. An historian who presents a popular TV series in the UK has suggested that Britain should return foreign treasures looted in past centuries if it wants to make international friends in the future. David Olasogo, a presenter on the BBC's recent Civilian series, said 21st century Asian superpowers like China were keenly aware that Britain had stolen parts of its history. Speaking at the Hay Festival, Olasogo said, I don't know how sustainable it is. Europeans and Americans having these museums full of stuff that was taken in violent raids from other countries when those other countries are now our trading partners countries we want to have good relationships with and financially beneficial relationships with well Olasoga cited amongst another of, a number of examples the treasures that were taken from the summer palace in Beijing in 1850 by Lord Elgin's sons Mr. Olusoga's comments come as several of Europe's most prominent museums were accused of hoarding artefacts stolen from African countries during colonization. So where are we with the moral argument on this issue? And where should one draw the line in deciding on what should and should not be returned?
To discuss this, I'm joined by David Anderson, a professor at African, of African History at Warwick University in the UK, and Han Hua, a fellow of the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University here in Beijing. Um, can I start with you, David, if I may? The UK is in possession of many world treasures that it plundered from other countries that they were invading. Some of those countries, mm. uh, some of those artifacts were sold in order to fund the UK's domination of that very country. We need to give these things back, don't we? I think it is becoming an increasingly embarrassing truth that the British Empire was a project of pillage and looting. And I don't think any serious historian any longer would try to deny this. So all of our museums in the UK, and indeed across Western Europe and in North America, are stuffed full of artifacts that were plundered and stolen in imperial wars. So the reality of this is, is, is quite clear. The question then, though, is what should we do about it? And should museums have to give these things back? Do the countries that they were taken from want them back? And if that's going to happen, how should it happen? So these are becoming increasingly important questions. And the cases you cite, the, the, uh, the attack on the Beijing Imperial Palace in 1860, and a number of African wars that resulted in major losses of regalia, royal artifacts, manuscripts, all kinds of historical objects. Uh, these, all these things now sit in European and British museums. And, and I can't help but reflect how angry the British people would be if their artifacts, perhaps the Mary Rose or the Magna Carta, were actually located in China or in South Africa or in Brazil. It's what would the clamour be in this country to have those things returned? Well, exactly, and it's also, isn't it, a symbol of national shame, surely, because these are the, the signs that we went round the world invading other countries. You, you would think that it would be viewed shamefully, but in fact, what has happened in the last 15 years or so, as this issue has begun to become more prominent, is that some of the museums have quietly rearranged their collections, and they've made the provenance of some of these artifacts less apparent to the public. So you won't find uh, statements that tell you directly where these artifacts have come from in all of our museums, some are better than others, but you won't find those statements in them all. So in a way, the shame is, 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 is apparent in the way that collections are unwilling to acknowledge the origins of these things. So we have, for example, in, in, in London, that we have the Benin Bronzes in the British Museum, we have uh, the, the, the Royal Regalia from Ashanti in the Wallace Collection in the, in the Museum of Mankind, we have other artifacts in the British Museum that were stolen from Ethiopia. And in case people think the museums have no complicity in this historically, you should realize that on some of these imperial war missions, the British Museum sent its curators to purchase goods. And after battles like that at Makwala in Ethiopia, the regiments concerned actually held public auctions at which the museum bought the artifacts. The money raised in those auctions being given as war booty to the soldiers who'd fought in the campaign. This was a normal British practice in every campaign from around the 1830s onwards. Anwa, you could argue though, couldn't you, that these were very different times. This is what happened in those days. This sort of thing doesn't happen these days. Yes, uh, this is a national shame on us as well, given in the back almost a hundred years ago, between, especially between 1840 to 1940, it's estimated that about over 10 million uh, Chinese treasures were stolen, robbed, or even traded overseas. And uh, up until now, for the past 30 years, there are about a very a minimum piece of that huge amount antiques about hundreds of them were uh, returned or reclaimed or purchased back to China. But there's also the practical issue here. It's all very well to say, yes, these things should go back to their countries, they should come back to China, but how do you actually do that? How do you go about moving all of these objects to a different countries? There's all sorts of grey areas here, like who owns the objects to start yes. with. 
For China, Chinese official standard is very clear, crystal and clear. China has been drawing the two international conventions that are regarded as the uh, guidelines for you know, treating the stolen and the rob robbed uh, treasures uh, by overseas. Uh, one is the tr uh, convention called the 70 tr uh, Convention under UNESCO, and the other is signed um, in 1995 called the 95 mm. Convention. So Chinese government has been working aggressively under these two conventions, signing uh, both bilateral or multilateral agreements with different governments. Uh, treating these uh, treasures or antiques to be either reclaimed or brought back to China. And the China even offered a certain amount of money or uh, purchased m money to, to pay to those called the bona fide holders of these treasures. So we don't want to make it very clear or clarify if the trace cannot be identified as to whether the specific antique is robbed or stolen or traded overseas in the past history. But we now, as long as we can, the Chinese government is doing aggressively in getting some of them back. But of course there's also the issue of where they're going to be best looked after. We're not necessarily sure that if you send a treasure back to certain countries that it's going to be treated with the respect that it has been treated in the UK. In the UK it might be in a museum, in the National History Museum or elsewhere, and yet if it goes back to its country of origin, we've got no way of knowing whether it's going to be looked after for the future, David. Well, that question is always raised when this is discussed, but I think that's of secondary importance. I think the principle of who do these things belong to, who has rights in them, and whose heritage are they actually about, I think those are the primary questions. There are certainly some African countries where the museum's system uh, is, is not in a condition where they would easily receive such valuable treasures and find them easy to, to store and look after. But I think we should address those questions directly. And if such museums need assistance to be able to accommodate these artifacts, then why not rally around and do something about helping them to do that? Because surely these artifacts should be returned to their places of origin. I mean, the Benin bronzes, for example, from Nigeria, there are over 2,000 Benin bronzes scattered around the museums of the world. Almost every great museum in Europe and Northern North America has a collection of several dozen of these very, very valuable bronzes. They are amongst the most valuable artworks on the planet. You know, these should be back in Nigeria. They should not be scattered around the globe. They should be contributing to Nigeria's cultural heritage. And if there are impediments in doing that effectively, let's address those impediments and not block them. But it's not al always easy to work out who actually owns these objects, or who, rather who did own these objects, because certainly in Africa, a lot of the borders have changed since these objects were originally taken, haven't they? There will be some problems about identification of provenance, for sure, there always are. And it's worth pointing out, of course, that not all of the objects that are of great value and of great historical interest are in national museums. Uh, the British uh, imperialists who captured most of these uh, artifacts and looted them, they were often distributed among the soldiers themselves. So officers, for example, would take artifacts for their private collections. So I dare say there's hardly a stately home in the United Kingdom that doesn't have plundered and looted artifacts somewhere in its private collections. So that would raise another issue about how you access to those and how you prove ownership of those particular artifacts because they're not in control of governments and national archives or museums. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. Han Hua, briefly, if you wouldn't mind, everyone in China is taught at school mm -hmm. uh, basic history that the Allied first forces came in and they burned down yes. one of the greatest palaces in Asia, they right. took away a lot of the treasures. What's the official Chinese position then on the return of these artifacts? Uh, as I said, first, the Chinese official government is going through under this, the two conventions signed in both uh, for, uh, 1970s and 1995. Also, the Chinese government is working on multi-levels, such as by purchasing through the private owners and uh, to, to open the diplomatic negotiation with the relevant governments or the uh, public 
or private museums regarding specific uh, Chinese artifacts. Also, the uh, Chinese government is encouraging the owners of these Chinese treasures, uh, both uh, overseas, to donate uh, those treasures back to the Chinese museums as well by, uh, by certainly you know, offering some of the bona fide uh, holder money to them. Uh, these are uh, aggressive and effective measures. And uh, let me add this on here. Mm. I agree with David Anderson that uh, th th this, there is no uh, importance to see, you know, to trace the evidence or the exact, like the country where the antiques come from. The journey itself is of great importance. These antiques are not becoming antiques because of it's just the, the face value or how many years it endured, but also because of its presence mm. and you know the history it go along with the people and the country. Okay, Han Hua, thank you very much indeed for that from the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University and David Anderson from Warwick University. Thank you both very much indeed for that. Okay. Well, here's my take on the issue for what it's worth. As a white British man in China, it's hard not to squirm at some of the points that have been raised in the last few minutes. There's no doubting the British, along with many other countries, strode across the globe, trampling on nations and civilizations in search of a glorious empire, an empire that was, for the most part, cruel, demeaning and vicious. But every country has its dark side. All nations have blood on their hands in one way or another. Britain has moved forward. The days of empire are thankfully long gone, but these spoils of war, if you like, are still here. Safely at arm's length behind glass cabinets and on pedestals are the souvenirs we took from our bloody travels. And we should give them back, just like we freed our slaves and withdrew from foreign lands. But it's not as simple as that. These treasures may be souvenirs, but they're not mere baubles. They're orphaned slices of history far from home. Britain, along with other countries, has a moral duty to look after their spoils, to make sure they're cared for. But there must be no knee-jerk reaction here. Each piece of art, each sculpture, each jewel has its own story and its own needs. Britain needs to meet those needs on a case-by-case -case basis, like a social worker making sure each child is given to the right home. Politics comes into it for sure, as does history. But like warring parents vying for custody of a child, each party needs to think first about the treasure itself. Where should it be housed? Where will it be best cared for? Where will it be more effectively appreciated? It might mean a joyous return to the motherland. It might mean staying in the UK or even going somewhere completely new. No one knows. But their journey to their forever home needs to start now. Well, that's all from this edition of The Point. You can download the application called CGTN and watch the show again on your mobile devices. But from me and from the team, bye-bye. Thank you for watching.